prophet Isaiah came because the people of God had strayed away from God and he was calling them to return to God. He, he said there's going to be a, a judgment that's going to come, but this over, um, overarching theme that just keeps reoccurring over and again is that for those who do return to God, um, there is a salvation in his name and it's going to come through a Messiah Savior who we know is Jesus Christ. So here's some of the verses that were written about the coming of God's Savior, Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then in Isaiah 7 we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we know that the name Emmanuel means God with us. And so God came to be with us through the promised Messiah, Messiah Savior, Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, you may be seated.
Advent. In this season of waiting, we look back at the first advent of Jesus when he was born in a manger as a humble baby. And we also look forward to his return when he will come as a conquering king. It is in this season of in-between that we, his people, wait. In a world rolled by death, disease, and war, and plagued by hardship and sorrow, we remember the victory brought by Christ on the cross and the grace and power of his resurrection. In this time, we look forward to the day when he will come as conquering king and lord of lords. And it is in this spirit of Advent that we wait and we pray, Come, Lord Jesus, come. So we do celebrate a time of Advent as a church as we wait on the coming of the Lord and remember what all that means. Um, It's interesting, if you read the scriptures, Jesus never told us to celebrate his birth. He did tell us to celebrate or remember his death, burial, and resurrection. And we do that when we come uh, to the Lord's table, every time we hear or share the gospel. Um, We will be coming to the Lord's table today in just a little while. And um, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we want to invite you to that. Um, we uh, also uh, ask that when we, you get the little containers, uh, as the deacons hand them out, that you hold on to it and we'll all eat the bread and drink the cup together. Also, if uh, you have a hard time getting the cellophane open on these, um, Alan over here, uh, wave your hand, uh, is going to be uh, having some that are already open. And the ones that are already open are also gluten free um, if you need that. So uh, we'll be having a time of uh, worship with communion in just a few minutes. Um, And even though Jesus never really said, celebrate my birth, we do. And we do so in such a a way that we worship him. Uh, You know, just like we would celebrate the birthday of someone that we love, we want to celebrate Jesus and honor him. And um, we do so remembering um, the full significance of why he came. And so today... Uh, In just a few minutes, uh, Adam uh, Segrist is going to come, and he's going to light the first of our Advent candles, and it's a candle of hope reminding us that our eternal hope and hope day by day comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So, Adam, if you would come at this time, please.
So as our deacons serve, <clears throat> we invite you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, to take the elements and they go serve. Thank you. So as they serve, <clears throat> they will present you a, a cup and a wafer for bread. And you are invited as a believer in Jesus Christ to partake. But I do ask, as it has been mentioned, that we wait, that we wait to observe the Lord's Supper together. The setting is the upper room. It's the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. Jesus is with his disciples. We can pick up the story in John chapter 13. It starts out really saying that Jesus loved his disciples until the end. Or another way to say that he loved his disciples to the end is he loved them to the fullest extent. And he went on to tell them he was giving them a new commandment. It was really something that they had heard before, that they should love one another. That people would know that they are his disciples by the way they love one another. But he was setting a new standard for us to love one another as he loves us, the model and example that he had given. And so we examine ourselves in that light, to love one another as Christ loves us. Paul says to consider how we take the Lord's Supper, to be mindful of remembering Jesus. So the Apostle Paul gives us some instructions to take the Lord's Supper in a worthy way, to examine ourselves, to remember Jesus Christ. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me and to wait, to wait for one another. And on that occasion, Jesus took the wafer, he took the bread and he said that this is my body given for you and he gave thanks heavenly father we give thanks for jesus christ coming from heaven to earth as a babe we thank you for his obedience to journey to the cross so that we might have forgiveness of sin amen and then he took the bread And then in a similar way, Jesus said the, the juice, the cup, is a new covenant in my blood, a new covenant of grace that our sins are forgiven by receiving and following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, remembering the reason he came to earth, the reason he came as a babe, and he gave thanks. Oh, Father, we thank you for the cup, for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which is our new covenant, that we are covered by the grace of our Savior Jesus, the babe in a manger who grew, was obedient, and followed you, and journeyed to the cross, and there shed his blood so that our sin debt would be covered. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. And then take the cup. So may the grace and peace that can be only known through Jesus Christ abide in you. Live well, love well, 
as his example is for us. One of our Advent themes is Christ, our hope in life and death, or hope. And we're going to sing Christ, our hope in life and death. He's for abundant life here, for eternal life in heaven where everything will be perfect, no more sin. If you're able to, let's stand and let's sing Christ, our hope in life and death. We'll start with, oh, sing hallelujah. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to him belong. Who holds our days within his hand? What comes apart from his command? And what will keep us to the end? The love in which we stand, oh, sing hallelujah, oh, sing troubled soul God is good God is good where is his grace and goodness known in our great redeemer's blood who holds our faith when fears arise who stands above the stormy trial who sends a ways that bring us nigh and to the shore the rock Continue as we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Oh, come, oh. 
ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the sun Father God, we do thank you so much uh, for this season of hope that we get to celebrate every year. Just as we know that Jesus came once to earth to be born and live a perfect life and pay the penalty for our sins, we know also that we have the hope that Jesus will come again. Lord, I pray that during this season uh, that is so busy and uh, full of activities, Lord, that we would stop and let that hope 
uh, influence the way we live our life and how we act in front of other people, uh, how we're uh, treating our family members. Let's, let us just Im be imbued by that hope, the joy and knowledge uh, that we do have a Savior and that he has come and cared so much for us and that he is coming again. I pray for Pastor Jim and the message that he brings. Help it to impact our lives. Uh, we thank you so much for this church and body of believers who gather here and even those that, that aren't able to be here but are watching online. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and glad that you're here. Uh, good to see everybody. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving and... Um, Whatever, whatever it is that you did. Uh, last week in the message, we focused kind of on the front end of Thanksgiving, and we looked at the character of true thanks and what genuine thanks really looks like in our worship. And, and so today I want to look at the back end of Thanksgiving and the giving side of it, and where does giving fit into Thanksgiving? And to do that, I, I selected a scripture that will probably be familiar with just about everybody here. It's in Luke chapter 19, if you want to turn there. And uh, we'll be looking at that in just a second. Um, uh, the setting of this, uh, of course, being the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all are biographical accounts of things that happened uh, in Jesus' earthly ministry when he was here 2,000 years ago. And, and so um, this account that we're getting ready to read actually took place just days, uh, a day or two before the last week that Jesus had in his earthly ministry right before he went to the cross. And so this is towards the very end of his earthly ministry. Um, and uh, he uh, has already chosen his 12 disciples and poured into them for almost three years. He has uh, uh, taught people all over Galilee and Judea, Judea um, about the kingdom of God. He's uh, confronted the religious leaders about the waywardness of their religion. He has healed people who are sick. He caused the blind to see. He has cast demons out of people. So all this has been going on. And it says this in Luke chapter 19, verse 1, that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So he's not like staying there for a long time. He's just passing through. He's on his way to Jerusalem uh, because the triumphal entry is coming up, all right? Um, and, and behold, so as he's passing through Jericho, verse 2, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on the account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And for years, I mean, I've spoke on this, I don't know how many times and different things, but I love, I love this account and encounter that happened in the life of Jesus with Zacchaeus. Um, you know, he, he was passing through Jericho. And, and the reason is that he was, he was, you know, back in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so he's on this journey to Jerusalem. Jesus knows he's going to offer his life as a sacrifice when he gets to Jerusalem. But he's like dead set on going there. And, 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 Jer and he was probably coming from Jordan. And so Jericho is right by the Dead Sea. It's, 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 it's like uh, 
800 feet below sea level. And then, and then he's headed towards Jerusalem, which you have to go to the... He, he was going to the Mount of Olives to, to come into Jerusalem. And that's 3,000 feet above sea level. And it's about an 18-mile journey. And we're going to put up some pictures here. Um, because there was such an, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was such an incline, there were, there were spots where it was very treacherous. If you could put up the other one. And, and pretty steep at, at some points on this road um, from Jericho. Uh, to Jerusalem. So that's what Jesus is doing. And, and so he's coming through Jericho. Now, Jericho was an up-and-coming city of the day. It was a thriving city. Um, one of the historians, Josephus, who was a first century historian, said that Jericho is the fattest city in the land. And what he meant by that, it is a thriving, healthy, vibrant, uh, young city that's growing. And here you got this guy, Zacchaeus, and he is one of the tax collectors there. We know he's one of them because he was the chief one. He was like the supervising tax collector. So vocationally, that, that was Zacchaeus, a tax collector. And, and that means he was a Jewish man who worked for a foreign government, the Roman government, that was occupying the land. And the people didn't like the way that they occupied the land. They thought they were too harsh and too, too difficult. And so the people didn't like tax collectors who were Jewish because they're working for the oppressive foreign government that's overtaken the land. And, 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 and there were a lot of different taxes, I guess, that they had to collect because uh, the Romans had poll tax, which included each resident and possessions. They had an income tax. They had a tariff tax. tax, tax. I think they had some other kind of taxes. Um, and materially, uh, it says that he was wealthy. And, and the way the tax collectors got wealthy, and, and I've read this place, I'm not sure how it works, so I'm really not sure about this one, but the, like they could charge more than what the taxes really were and pilfer off the top. I don't, I don't know if they really did that or not, but that would be crazy. I think probably the way they usually made their money was that, you know, when people couldn't pay their taxes and they're in crisis, the tax collectors would say, well, I'll give you another week, but now you got to pay this much. And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they up that price. And so they get a, again, scrape off the top. So people um, didn't like tax collectors. We also learn here that physically he was short. Spiritually, he was wayward. Socially, he was an outcast. The people didn't like him, you know. It kind of helps us understand why he ran ahead of the crowd. He was a short guy, couldn't see over the people. So I, I think he runs in the sense of he probably didn't want to listen to whatever people had to say to him. So he runs on ahead, gets up in a tree so he can kind of see over the crowd and see Jesus when he gets up there. He wanted to see Jesus. And he was like the, the religious uh, leader that was coming through town and he'd heard about him. Now, when Jesus gets there, Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down. Yeah, this is in verse 6. I'm, I'm going to your house today. All right, Zacchaeus, um, uh, it, well, I guess verse 6 says, Zacchaeus says, it says that Zacchaeus came down. And he welcomed Jesus gladly, if you can get the picture in your mind. And then verse 7 says, when they saw it, when the crowd, okay, when the crowd of people saw it, they began to grumble. And I can kind of hear them. It's like, you got to be kidding, Zacchaeus. You know, I mean, I mean, somebody's got to tell Jesus that he's one of the tax collectors and, and Jesus doesn't need to be hanging out with him, you know. Um, and, and, and Jesus probably doesn't even know he's a tax collector. Somebody's got to tell him. And so they're muttering and they're probably getting louder. And you can kind of almost, you know, almost hear him. Hey, Jesus, Zacchaeus, he's a tax collector. You don't want to hang out with him. And he, he's been exploiting the people in this city for years. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, my, my, you know, maybe one of them said, yeah, my brother, he's in, he's in jail right now because Zacchaeus wouldn't even give him an extra week to be able to get his taxes together. And so, so they're yelling things about him. And here's Zacchaeus, and he's standing there with Jesus, and all these negative things are being said about him. And it was a moment of grace. Because Jesus didn't condemn Zacchaeus, and he didn't just leave. Now, mercy is to not get what you deserve. And so if you deserve judgment and, and rejection, to not get judgment and rejection is mercy, okay? Grace is when you do get what you don't deserve. If, if you don't deserve um, acceptance and forgiveness, but someone gives you acceptance and forgiveness, they give you that out of grace, okay? And so this was a day of grace, Jesus 
Uh, and, you know, he, he's not condemning him. It's a mercy. And then he's giving him his, his, you know, his forgiveness and his acceptance. And that day with Jesus, that day of grace in Zacchaeus' life, it changed his life forever. Um, what a moment of grace. <laughs> Jesus did not condemn Zacchaeus, and he did not walk away. We know that that grace changed him because he went from being a taker to being a giver. He, he went from being greedy to being generous. He went from being a self-focused to being other people concerned. He, he went from being self-pleasing to being God-pleasing. And, and, and we read it here in verse 8. Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord. He, he's now confessing Jesus is his Lord. I mean, my life is now lined up with you. You're my Lord. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. <laughs> and Zacchaeus was so overwhelmed by the grace of God that was like, I just, you know, have you ever been there? Like, man, I just got to do something to express my love and my gratitude back to the one that's been so gracious and good to me. I, I, I just got to do it. And the only thing you think of doing is, with, you know, I'm going to give to the poor, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to straighten things out for the people that I've cheated. <laughs> By the way, did you notice that his giving heart, it was not an obligation, it was an opportunity. It wasn't like, well, you know, now that I guess I'm, I got God around here, I guess I better do something, you know. It wasn't like that. It's like, I guess I got to follow. It's like, man, I, love was overflowing in his heart. And he's like, I got to do something. And this is what I want. I want to show my love. By the way, there's an old story about a husband and a wife who really didn't love each other. And uh, the man was very demanding, so much so that he prepared a list of do's and don'ts and rules for his wife to abide by. And, and one of the rules was she had to read the list every day and then do everything that was on the list. And so among those things on the list of do's and don'ts is what time she was to get up in the morning, when she was to serve breakfast, how the housework was supposed to be done, what she could and couldn't buy when she left the house. And several years later, that husband died, okay? And then several years after that, she finds this other guy, and she ends up marrying him. And, and this guy loves her dearly. And, 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 and he does everything that he can to, 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 to make her feel honored and loved, like the honor and love that was in his heart. And he would, he would give her a lot of words of affirmation, and he gave her gifts and tokens of appreciation, and he protected her, and he valued her. Okay, so you get the picture. Now, one day she's cleaning the house, and she's going through a drawer, and she finds the old list from her first husband. And she takes it out, and she begins to read that list, and she realizes that she's already doing all those things that was on that list in her, in her second marriage. You know what I mean? And, and, and it's like, but she was doing them not out of obligation, but it was just an opportunity to, to go back and express the love that was in her heart uh, for her husband. There's, okay, so now with that, there's basically two ways that people can serve God. Number one, some people serve God out of obligation. <laughs> You know, it's, it's like they do their part and they say there. Now, you know, God's here. And, and so, so look at what I've done. I've, I've, I've done it. I've checked it off, you know, the box. I've, I've done what I'm supposed to do. It's out of obligation. And then other people, they serve out of love. And, 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 and now doing those things, it's like an expression of, of love and thanksgiving from the heart. There's something about being overwhelmed by the grace of God that makes giving an opportunity to love God, not just an obligation to follow some rule. <laughs> and it's sad, but I think it's easy. Okay, you with me? It's sad, but I think it's easy for us. People who know the Lord and and. I think it's easy for us to lose that sense of awe of the grace of God. We can even get over the years like maybe a little bit entitled. You know, like I'm doing a pretty good job as a Christian, so God kind of owes me a little. I mean, we know that's wrong, but I think we sway that way sometimes. 
you know. Um, I, by the way, I was going through some things in one of my drawers not too long ago. And um, as, as I was, I came across an old picture that my daughter drew for me when she was just a little girl. And um, by the way, the color coordination was not very good on this picture. And she didn't stay in the lines at all. It was kind of like a scribble. But I've kept it over the years. And do you know why? <laughs> because I know that there was a day so, several years ago when there was a little girl that drew me that picture out of the love of her heart and she was excited when she gave it to me and and I was excited that she gave it to me I didn't love that picture because of the color coordination or the fact whether or not she stayed in the lines I loved that picture because I loved the one that drew the picture okay and 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 I treasure it and so I think what this story with Zacchaeus reminds me of is that there is a God who values us even though sometimes we scribble outside the lines. And I look at Zacchaeus and I say, here's a guy who messed up pretty good. And yet he's overwhelmed at the grace of God. And he begins to show it in several ways. His love back to God. Um, his life adjustments. The major life adjustments that we hear about here is he vows to give half of his estate to the poor and he wants to pay back everybody four times the amount that he ever took from anyone. And so here's what I want to do. I want to look at the back end of Thanksgiving, the giving end of Thanksgiving. And, and when we give with love and thanks overflowing in our heart, Giving is not some obligation we do because God's around. No, no, when we're really giving out of love, giving is an opportunity to express the love and the value of God in our heart. And so, so when we really give with thanksgiving and love, giving becomes an opportunity, first of all, to exercise faith in God. And, and up to this time, Zacchaeus... Um, uh, he, he had faith in his own finances. He was trusting in his estate to give him that sense of security. He was, he was trusting in his stuff to give him fulfillment, significance, and security, okay? And then he was even willing to cheat and to steal and to do whatever he could to get more stuff so that he could feel significant and so that he could feel secure. And now all of a sudden in one day... <laughs> He's changing from having faith in things to give him significance and fulfillment and security. And now he's trusting God for significance, fulfillment, and security. All in one day that happened. And his giving was an expression of that. My faith is not in my stuff. My faith is in God who gives all the stuff, okay? You know, and so he's putting his faith in God. I had a conversation from somebody at, at our church, and, and I think I had two, but I, I, I remember one more more vividly in my mind, but I think there's been two times this has happened, but once in about the last, oh, I don't know, just the last few months, somebody came in, and they're asking me, hey, can I get some of those <clears throat> giving envelopes, you know? It's like, it's like <laughs> this person is reaffirming their faith in Jesus Christ, and what do they want? They want offering envelopes so that they can give. Why? Because it's some big obligation? No, but because it's an opportunity to express faith in God. I'm now putting my faith in Jesus Christ. You know, um, when, when I, I was a pastor in Kirksville, Missouri, now this was years ago, um, we had a building on our campus. It was a gymnasium, and it had some classrooms around it and a kitchen on one end. And one day in August, this building that our church had, a nice day in August, the whole roof, and by the way, nobody was in it, but the whole roof collapsed and went down. And so the insurance company wasn't going to pay anything because... It was just a night, you know, nothing like a tornado or anything came through. The building just came down. So, so it was kind of a poor church, blue collar church up in Kirksville. And, and, and so we found out that, by the way, we started meeting in the high school because they condemned our whole building, our whole campus. And um, because the, the one building fell in and, and we had to remove all the rubble before we could go back to the part that was still standing. And so we're meeting in the school and it was going to cost over $10,000 just to get rid of all the rubble. And this church had no money, okay? And so uh, Gene and I, we started started praying about it and, 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 and everything. And so I walked into church the second Sunday we had, the first Sunday we were in shock, okay, when we met at the high school. Second Sunday I walk in and, and Gene and I had been praying about it and we looked into our savings account and I said, okay, we got to raise over $10,000 in this church soon. And so, so Gene and I, we've been praying about it. I'm going to give this offering. And I told him and, and, and I laid it in there and I said, I want everybody in church, just pray about what 
you can give and give. And, and so on Tuesday, there's this guy that walks in my office, and he's all giddy and excited and everything. And he walked in my office, and he says, hey, um, my wife and I, we, uh, we, we looked back over. They, they had just retired. We looked back over our re- retirement savings and everything. And anyway, we did what you said, and we prayed. And so I want to give you a check. And he, so he gives me a check. And you know how pastors are? I say, oh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, let's have prayer together. He goes, no, look at it. <laughs> just like that I go okay you know because you know pastors we don't look at it you know so I looked at it five thousand dollars and this guy was so excited about giving it you know and and I just think when we have that thanksgiving and love in our heart giving's not some dreaded obligation it it's an opportunity to exercise faith we 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 remember where our faith through the years I've had people give that 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 have hardly nothing give substantial gifts out of the love of god flowing in their heart and if you ask those people you know why did you give that gift you know what they'll say to say because my faith is not in a job or in things my faith is in god and so opportunity to to exercise faith not all my points are that long okay Um, Here's number two. Um, It immediately, when we give with love, it becomes an opportunity to express thanksgiving. You know? Zacchaeus was overwhelmed that God would want him. And he wants to give thanks. And so the way that he says thanks is he gives a tangible gift. What better way to say thanks to God than to give a tangible gift to to some some people who are close to God's heart and God loves? And that's what he does. Half of it, boom, to the poor. (laughs) I want to give to the ones that God cares about. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed that when you really love somebody, you want to do something tangible with your love? You, you want to tell them, but you also maybe want to, you know, uh, cook a favorite meal, give a little gift, uh, get a trinket, um, take them someplace special, you know? We want to do something tangible. Do you know that back in 1991, and some of you weren't born yet, I know that, but, but back in 1991, we had this thing called Desert Storm. Those of you who are old like me, you kind of remember those days. And, and we, you know, we sent like four or 500,000 troops from the United States over to the Middle East for that campaign. And in that, they had all these logistics like, phone booths so that people could call up their loved ones and they had all these um this mail system that they set up but the mail system didn't make it 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 broke down and do you know why because americans didn't want to just send letters to their loved ones they wanted to send cookies radios clothes trinkets all kinds of stuff and it clogged up the whole system and i'm kind of kind of reminded of that here with Zacchaeus it's like he didn't want to just say thank you to God he wanted to do something tangible and so he comes up with this way to be able to give out of thanksgiving generously and purposely from the heart um you know if if you really are overwhelmed with thanksgiving this year you know Why not ask God to lay some need, some person, some ministry on your heart and then give joyfully and generously, you know, and with a whole heart to whatever it is that God lays on your heart. Giving's a way to give thanks. Um, When we really give with thanks and love, giving is a way to elevate God's word. It's an opportunity to elevate God's word. Once that key is focused on Jesus being the Lord of his life, look, Lord, here's what I'm going to do. It says, it, says, it says in verse 8, Zacchaeus said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. So where did he get that system of giving back fourfold? And I think it goes back to, what he understood is the word of God. Now, Zacchaeus was a Jewish man, so he would have had some instructions in the Old Testament scriptures. And in Exodus 22, there's this, there's this basic law that if you steal from someone, you need, to, you need to give back what you took with restitution. And the, the repeated restitution in Exodus chapter 22 is often, it says, if you take a cow from somebody, you need to give them back their cow plus an extra cow, twice as much. If you take somebody's sheep, you give back their sheep, and you give back another sheep. You give back two, two times as much. But then in Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, 
This is kind of interesting. It says in verse 1, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, so now you don't have the original one to give back with another one. If it's gone, he says, um, he shall repay he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. And I think what Zacchaeus is doing here when he said, I'm going to pay back four times as much, I think he's taking responsibility and says, I, you know, maybe, maybe he's saying, I don't understand all that God's word says, but I don't want to give back just, just what I took plus a double. I want to give back four. I want to make sure that I'm honoring the word of God in the way that I'm making restitution for the things that have gone haywire in my life, okay? You know, I th- by the way, I think this is why Many, now not by, why all, but I think this is why many New Testament believers really want to practice tithing. You know, you find a lot more about tithing in the Old Testament than you do the New Testament. But I think there's something about being a New Testament believer and being overwhelmed by the grace and mercy of God in our life where, where we look at our lives and, and we say, man, God's the, God's the owner of everything. He's blessed me with everything that I have. But if I can take a percentage like 10%, like a tithe, 10%, tithe means 10%. If I can take that 10% and give it to the Lord, set it aside as holy to the Lord, and still have an open heart for whatever other giving he would want me to do, but if I could do that as a way of acknowledging God as the giver of all and acknowledging him as the Lord of my life and acknowledging that I want to be part of his work in the world, I'm going to do that. You know, And I think that's where a lot of people are at. By the way, this scripture in Zac- about Zacchaeus, it doesn't say anything about tithing here. But I think the implication is here you have a a New Testament believer looking at Old Testament instructions and saying, I just want to make sure that I'm honoring the word of God with what I have. And I'm doing it the best I know how. Um, By the way, here's here's one of the scriptures about tithing from the Old Testament. It's Malachi 3.10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. And there's something about being aware of the fact that Jesus came to this world for me, that he submitted to all kinds of disgrace and ridicule and suffering and pain for me on the cross. And he wiped my slate clean and brought full forgiveness before God the Father. And he secures my, as the risen Lord, he secures my place in God's kingdom forever. And he gives me his Holy Spirit and promises to be with me always and to guide me and to direct me and and to empower me and to comfort me every day of my life. I'm I'm just going to give. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 2 on the first day of every week each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when i come paul was collecting an offering he said every week set aside your amount you know and 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 i i like to set aside a percent and i want to do it in a way that honors god's word and so that's kind of where gene and i've got the idea that we want to be practicing tithers but but the issue is is my it does not not does god have my money the issue is does god have my heart and if he has my heart am i am i living consistent with what i know of his word when we really give with thanks and love giving also becomes an opportunity to extend god's kindness proverbs fourteen thirty one. whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker but he who is generous to the needy honors him Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. Do you know that every time you give, every time you give to missions, every time you give to like the Operation Christmas Child to get those boxes around the world in Jesus' name, every time that you give to our, our you know, we're getting ready to do our uh, international missions offering. We do it at Christmas time because what a better time to share God's love than Christmas and, 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 and with our missionaries. And, and we call it the Lottie Moon offering and because Lottie Moon was a missionary and we want to give in, in, in her name. And, and every time that we give to the benevolent offering, every time that we just give to the general offerings 
of our church. We are giving not just to a church to have some kind of business that continues. We're giving so that the good news of Jesus Christ can get out into the world and that, and that people's lives can be changed and that hope can be restored and that lives can be restored and that relationships can be restored because of Jesus working in people's lives. That's why we give. And so one last thing. When we give out of thanks and love, giving becomes an opportunity to be used by God. Zacchaeus had spent, now, now get this. Zacchaeus had spent his whole life using the things of God on himself. And this excerpt in the scripture was the very first day of Zacchaeus' life that he offered his life to be used for the purposes of God. What an amazing thing that God would not just cleanse us and want us as part of his eternal kingdom, but he'd want to use us in his purposes in this world today. What an amazing thing that God would want to use someone like me. You know, someone like you. Have you ever thought that God would want to use someone with my personality with my sense of humor, with my gifts and abilities, with my struggles and, 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 and you know, and, and my shortcomings, he would want to use me and his purposes. What a privilege. What a privilege to be able to be used. You know, there's this little scripture in, I, I'm not sure if it's 1st or 2nd Corinthians. It says 1st on, um, on the scripture. But 1st um, Corinthians 8, 4 um, might be 2nd. Uh, it, it, it talks about Paul. He was taking up an offering uh, for, the, for the poor uh, believers back in Jerusalem. But when he got to Macedonia, he realized the believers in Macedonia were as poor or poorer than the ones back in Jerusalem. So he kind of tells them they, they, they get a pass on the offering, okay? And, and, and here, listen to what it says. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. So, so they decided we're going to give. Let's look at verse 4. They were begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Here you got believers, you know, that were told like, you know, you don't have to give. No, we want to. Let us be part of the offering. Man, we want to be part of what God's up to in the world. And then it says, and, and in verse 5, uh, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to the will of God to us. Oh, man, what an amazing thing. And so our giving, you know, it's, it's not something we do out of obligation. No, but when God's love and thanksgiving wells up in our heart, the back end of thanksgiving is giving. We give as an opportunity to, to, to extend faith, to exercise our faith, as an opportunity to show thanks. We give as an opportunity to, to, to honor the word of God and, and to extend the kindness of God and be used by God in this world. And so... Um, I want to end with just some questions we're going to put up on the screen. And, you know, as you think about these things, do I give out of obligation or love? And I put that up there because it's possible to start giving out of love, but then kind of slip into this obligation part of it. And so where are you? And what's, how's God speaking to you today? Do you give out of obligation or love? Number two, have I accepted God's gift of salvation? Ha, ha, have you ever opened up your life to faith in Jesus Christ that you might know him as Savior and Lord? Have you ever been like Zacchaeus? Maybe you like him. He, he, he never knew God. And then in one day, he's overwhelmed by the grace. Of God. I'm here today to tell you God loves you and, and he provides an eternal salvation for you in Christ. And you can come today and just say, man, I, I, I just need to know that I know that I got Christ in my life. Have I given my life to God by faith? And then some questions about giving. Does the way I give reflect faith in God? You know, have I turned to God? Uh, th does the way I give express thanksgiving? Or is it just out of obligation? Does the way I give elevate God's word and his instructions? And does the way I give extend kindness? back into the world. So um, we're going to have a uh, song of reflection. And I asked, you know, on the uh, listening sheet that I gave you today, those questions are on there. You know, just kind of that we could let, let God speak to our heart personally today. Let, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And um, 
God, I thank you that there is an amazing grace of God that is available for us who do not deserve it, that we might be part of your kingdom forever. Thank you that we can be children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And then, God, I pray that we would once again today be overwhelmed by your grace. And God, forgive us for the times we give out of obligation. And Father, I pray that you would just take thanks and make us into givers that would honor you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us at this time. And uh, your pastors will be here to receive you if there's prayer needs or if you want to make commitments to God or you just want to um, let us celebrate how the Lord's working in your life. So you, you feel free to come as we sing. Lord, you have my heart and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice, and I
with us today, and I, I don't usually do this, but I never really get a, ch hasn't really had much chance to do this. But I want to say that um, we want to give a special welcome to one who's here for the very first time, and that would be Lee Tan, uh, the son of Lauren and Lawrence Tan. And so we got him right over here. <laughs> and so... Um, Beautiful baby in the church today, so that's awesome. And so, Mike, would you come, please? We are so thankful for Lee Tan being here. We are so thankful that all of you are here today, that we had the opportunity to worship and give praise together, to share the love of Christ with each other, to be reminded of his call on us. Well, we want to make sure that each of you know that there's some things going on in this church we want you to be a part of every single part of it so check our poster boards check our website check your email blasts but next Sunday we want you to know that we're having a business meeting and I know that that may sound stodgy but it is an opportunity for us to come together and to hear what's going on and hear, see these reports and know what the life of Christ here is about and we will be approving our, uh, our business meeting. We'll be approving the budget for next year. So your presence here is very wanted and welcomed next Sunday at noon for the business meeting. Other than that, check all of our sites for information. We have resumed our regular services for now until Christmas. And we look forward to being with you on Wednesday evening. Our fellowship meal starts at 515. May God bless you and keep you until we see one another again. Praise be to God. And I will praise you. See you. 